Welcome to the Symbology Lecture, which is part of our GT101 course on Geographic Information Systems Basics. My name is Stuart Bruce. I'm GIS Program Coordinator at Washington College, and I hope you enjoy my lecture today. So what is symbology? Another word for symbology is classification. It's basically the process used to classify spatial features with different symbols and different colors. This allows the user or the viewer of your map to better understand what it is you're trying to get across. Um, you want to make your map uh, pleasing and you want to make it easy to identify what's going on so you can get your point across. It's really the whole purpose of uh, doing the map. There are several types of classification methods that you can use inside the ArcGIS desktop product. Um, which method you use depends a lot on the data that you're trying to use and what you're trying to get across. Um, we've listed uh, some of these here and um, I will be doing a demo of Symbology as well um, with the ArcGIS software so you can see this in action. Now the simplest way uh, to change the symbology of a feature is to use the single symbol um, option. So you can change the color and shape of all the features at the same time. Uh, very simple to use. I actually uh, briefly explained this in the introduction to ArcMap, so it'll give you a little bit of an idea of how to do that. Uh, one of the things here, you can see the uh, kind of little diagram down here. Uh, if you add a light glare and it comes in as purple, can I change it to blue? Yes, you can. Okay. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, it's my belief that uh, the software has a uh, ability to read your mind. And when you add a data layer to ArcGIS, it randomly assigns a color to it. And the odds of that being the color that you want it to be are just about as close to zero as you can get. So you will have to uh, basically change uh, the symbol color uh, when you add a new data set. Now, this symbol selector, um, you can pick from pretty much an infinite palette of colors. There are so many symbols there, um, there's not enough hours in a month to explain all of them. And if you have a polygon feature, you can put patterns inside the symbol. If you're doing lines, uh, there's all different kinds of lines you can do. Uh, railroads, dash lines, uh, different thickness of lines, uh, anything that you can possibly imagine uh, is available. And if you're doing points, uh, you can go with simple dots or squares or triangles or hospital shapes, uh, almost an infinite number of uh, symbols. And then the really cool thing about the ArcGIS desktop product is uh, don't find a symbol that you like. Well, guess what? You can make your own symbols and bring those into ArcGIS, which is pretty cool. Now, there are a number of standard symbols that load with the software. But there are also these things called symbol sets that you can add for additional things. Now, we do a lot of crime mapping at Washington College, and there is a crime symbol set. So if you want to show homicides, there's a little diagram of an outline of a body. Or if you're looking at recovered guns, there's little gun symbols that you can use, uh, things like that. So depending on what your industry is, odds are that there's a custom symbol set that you can load that's unique to your industry. Now the first classification uh, method I'm going to talk about is called the categories classification. Uh, this is also known as unique values. And basically you would use this when you want to have a different symbol um, symbolization of features based on their unique attributes. Uh, to give you an example, which is shown in the slide here, uh, let's say that uh, you wanted to have a different color for every county in Pennsylvania. Each county has a unique county name. And using the category's unique values, you could assign a different color for each county. Now, warning. Just because you can do a category's unique value classification doesn't mean that this is always the appropriate thing to do. Some things have so many different value classifications that when you start trying to differentiate them solely based on color, uh, it becomes almost impossible. So let's say that you had a thousand unique values. There's no way that you're going to find 1,000 different colors 
that would enable a viewer of your map to make any sense of the data at all. There are just simply not enough colors. Now, in theory, if you started mixing colors with fill symbols, you might be able to do that, but you're just going to have a very, very confusing map. So take this into accordance. Um, it's not always the appropriate method to use. Now, there are options within the Symbology tab uh, that you can use. Um, you can pick from what are known as standard color ramps, and these are uh, sort of multicolored rainbow palettes that you can pick from. Um, sometimes in our lessons, when we want you to use a specific color ramp, what we'll do is we'll give you the name of the color ramp because it's very difficult to describe. For example, we're looking now at the basic random palette, and I have no idea how I would describe that in words. Now, if you click your mouse inside the color ramp where the colors are, an option will appear um, to allow you to either look at it the graphic view or the text view. So sometimes when we say, you know, open up the basic random color ramp, uh, you'll have to change this so you can see the name. You can also change the actual color and symbol um, when you do unique values by simply double clicking on the symbol. So the example that I always use, let's say you're doing land use, you apply a color ramp to your land use unique values, but you want to change each one. Uh, for example, if you're doing land use, typically forest would be dark green, agriculture might be light green, residential might be yellow, and you're going to have to manually uh, go ahead and do that. Now, when you're done with it, you might want to save these settings as a layer file, which I am going to discuss. Now, saving as a layer file is kind of similar to saving as a template. Really what you're doing is you're saying that for this given data set, at this given location, if I open the layer file, I'm going to pull the data from that location on my computer, and I'm going to assign a certain color or a certain palette or symbolization to that each and every time I open it. So this is how you avoid having to always constantly change the color of a water feature, for example. So if you know you have water features and you know you always want them to be blue, once you set that, you would save this as a layer file, and then the next time you add that data, instead of adding the original data, you would simply add the layer file. Now, the next classification method I'm going to talk about is called quantities. Some attribute variables have a numeric value. Quantities only works with attribute data that's in the numeric format. You know, so, for example, um, you could have a GIS layer of sewer pipes. Maybe the pipes range from 2 to 16 inches in diameter. So I could do a quantities classification on that. There are two types of quantities classifications that you will use in ArcGIS. One is called graduated colors, where the colors, for example, would get darker the higher the numeric value is. The second is graduated symbols. And in this case, the size of the spatial feature would get larger or smaller depending on the numeric value that's assigned in the attribute table. Now, there are many classification methods that you can use in graduated colors, and uh, I feel that you should know what these methods are, and you should know how the different methods changes, how your maps will appear to the person looking at your classification. The method you use really depends on the distribution of your data. Um, you have to have an understanding of the range of values for your data, um, and this will help you determine the method uh, that you want to use. If you don't use the correct method that's appropriate with your data, then you could end up with an inaccurate representation of your data and the map. Now, I put here, uh, unless that's what you're trying to accomplish, uh, which I'll talk about at the end of the lecture briefly by referring you to a very excellent book to read. Now, the first classification method I'm going to talk about is the manual classification. Basically, with this, you get to pick what the range is. Now, I use the manual classification quite often. And primarily, if you can see the legend here, the reason I use it is I may use another classification method to get close to what I want. But then I actually go in and manually, 
I try to round off the values in the legend so that they end on even numbers. And I'll, I'll go over this a little bit more uh, inside my demo. The next classification method is called equal interval. And really what this is doing is that you pick the number of intervals that you want. And what it does is it equally divides the data into ranges. You see that kind of here in the legend. We went with equal interval. And each interval has a range of, uh, looks like 160,000. So 0 to 160,000, 160,000 to 320, to 480, to 640, and then the top value is 800. And this is because um, that last one there, it may not go up to the full range. But equal interval basically sets the range of the data to be equal. Now you could have all of your features, uh, let's say you had 100 features. So using equal interval, potentially you could have uh, 99 of them appear in the first range, none in the second three, and one in the last one. So equal interval is not always the best classification system to use for many data sets. The next one we're going to look at is called defined interval. So in this case, um, instead of choosing the number of classes, you pick the interval that you want the data to be divided in. After you pick the interval range, it then determines the number of classes that are necessary to show your data. I don't use this one very often myself, just to throw that out there. Quantile, what it does, it basically makes sure that for each of your classes that you pick, so let's say I want to have six classes, it makes sure that each class has the exact number of features in it. So this is a very good way of evenly distributing all of your features amongst the number of classes that you pick. Natural breaks are jenks. Uh, this is actually the default classification method for ArcGIS. So if you don't change anything at all, you'll be using the natural breaks or the Jenks classification. Now, this was developed by, guess who? Professor Jenks. And it's really kind of a sort of a custom classification method um, that in most cases works very well for showing your data. Uh, so if in doubt, using Jenks is typically not a mistake. Geometric interval, um, this is sort of a relatively new classification uh, method. Um, Esri sort of created this uh, complicated algorithm, and I'm just going to read it here, to find the geometric coefficient and ultimately a geometric series to best classify continuous data. Now, I'll be honest with you, uh, I'm not sure that I completely understand what the algorithm is, but Esri seems to think it's pretty keen. Uh, so you can try it on your data and see if uh, the visualization that results is something that you feel appropriately uh, displays your data to get the point that you want to make across. Standard deviation, uh, this is actually something that I do use a lot. And the classic example that I will give here is has to do with uh, the prices of parcels or assessments. So let's say you're looking at a homogeneous neighborhood, uh, for example, uh, in this map here, we have a subdivision, and most of the homes there are typically sized homes. Well, if you do a standard deviation from the mean, so let's say that the mean uh, property value is $100,000. So looking at the chart here, you can see that the green represents uh, minus uh, more than a half standard deviation low. The bright red is greater than 2.5 standard deviations. So when you look at data like this and you're looking for statistical anomalies, standard deviation works really well. So let's say that all the homes in this neighborhood were close to the mean, but you had one house in the neighborhood that, let's say just say that it was greater than two standard deviations lower than the assessed values of all the other homes in the neighborhood. Now, if you investigated that and you found out that the chief assessor for your county lived in that particular home, then you might suspect that there's something fishy going on. The other area where this comes in extremely useful is let's say that you are appealing the tax assessment of your property. So if you look at all the other homes in your neighborhood and you see that your property is assessed maybe greater than 2.5 standard deviation higher than all your neighbors, it's possible that someone made a mistake 
or you have uh, marble countertops and an in-ground swimming pool and you added an extra 5,000 square feet to your home. So it's a really good way to look at and analyze the data. Now, the next type of classification I'm going to talk about is called graduated symbols. Um, basically, um, I use this whenever I think that the size of the value is very important. Now, the example that I'm showing you here, uh, this is actually the rabbit transit routes for the city of York in Pennsylvania. And what I was trying to show with this map is I was trying to show which of the routes had the largest number of passengers. So by using the numeric uh, attribute of number of passengers, I was able to use graduated symbols. And when you look at the map, it really jumps out at you that the one particular line has more passengers because the line is simply much thicker. Whereas other lines you can see that are very thin have very few passengers. So it really gets your point across right away uh, to the viewer of your map where the volume is occurring within the rabbit transit system. Charts are another uh, great way to look at data. I like using charts a lot. Uh, the charting functions in ArcGIS are, are pretty decent. Um, sometimes it does a couple weird things that you don't want it to do. Um, I'll let you experience those for yourself. Um, basically, if you have too many charts going on, it can be a little overwhelming as well. There are three different kinds of charts you can use in the ArcGIS desktop product. Uh, the pie chart, the bar column, and the stack chart. Uh, I use a lot of pie charts. Uh, I think they look good. Uh, but I use them sparingly uh, and only in certain uh, situations. Now, What's the point of making your map look good? Well, presentation is the most important thing. It's just like if you're going for a job interview and if you show up and cut off shorts and Birkenstocks and a uh, Grateful Dead t-shirt, you know, the first impression that people get of you is that uh, you're clearly not qualified for the job. So the map's the same way. So when people pick your map up, if you have poor symbolization and you have colors that really look bad, um, then right away your audience has basically assumed that your map looks poor, therefore the analysis could be poor. Now on the flip side, you can have a really hot looking map, beautiful colors, and your data could be complete and total garbage. But your map looks good, so your audience is going into it with a positive view. Now the other thing is that if you improperly classify the data, you could actually mislead people. Now I think this is a uh, not something that you want to do, but who knows? Maybe you do want to mislead people. In which case, uh, I would recommend uh, a book. Um, this book is called How to Lie with Maps uh, by Mark Monmier. Always have a hard time pronouncing uh, his last name, but a uh, very excellent book. Uh, and you can see here on Amazon.com, it's uh, $10.35. Uh, it's actually a pretty good read and some interesting stories in there about how people lie with maps. So that ends my lecture on symbology. I hope you have a good day and uh, I'm going to do another lecture uh, actually showing you the demonstration of the software and expand upon some of the things that I talked about in this lecture.